glory, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory. Revealing how we made the lame to walk again, and he calls the blind to see. And then I cry, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. My Savior forever, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh, victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is due him he plunged me I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh yes, yeah, sing victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me, and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me, and I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. You sing about victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that blood, Lord. Thank you for that blood. Oh, that powerful redeeming blood. Woo, that cleansing blood. God, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Woo. My God. You know, it's amazing when you sit and really think about God really died for me. You were on his mind. The day he hung on that cross and that blood flowed. It was a gruesome scene at the time. But oh, how beautiful that blood makes. Take a sinner like me and and wash them white as snow. Thank you, Lord, for that blood. I love that song. My God. Thank you for the victory, Lord. Woo! <laughs> I was praying and kept coming to mind about focus. You know, I can pretty much sum up to you right now the way this world is going and what the news is going to say. God's getting closer to coming back. You know, we, we, if we stay focused, it doesn't matter what we have going on. It doesn't matter. If you read the Bible, I can tell you it, it, it's inevitable. God's coming back. Yes. It's going to get bad. But when you're washed by that sweet, precious blood, <laughs> I can tell you how much victory you have. It doesn't matter what this world may say. We got to focus on this big picture. We got to focus on the spirit. The way somebody votes or what party they vote for is not going to get them into heaven. But by us staying focused and preaching the blood of Christ and preaching and telling about the victory that God has given each and every one of us, that's going to get those souls. We have to stay focused, church. Woo! Don't you feel good today? I'm going to tell you, it's the Holy Ghost, brother. I was out working today, and I, I tell you, whew, I got overheated. You know how many times I said, man, I'm just going to lay out tonight. And you can ask my wife, I'm, I'm telling you, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Come on, let's get excited tonight. You have the victory. <laughs> Turn around, shake your neighbor's hand, and say, wake up. Let's love the Lord tonight. Shout hallelujah. Woo. Amen. Some days I'm focused. And other days, I, I think they used to sell a, uh, an enhancer uh, focus factor, I believe, of vitamins or some herbs or whatever. And uh, I'm guilty tonight. I need some focus factor <laughs> in my brain tonight. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. One thing about it is that I am building. I'm not finished. I'm building on my walk with God. And my relationship with the Lord. Now, I don't have no room to condemn you. So if your construction's looking a little shoddy, <laughs> if your construction's looking looking a little down, I'm not I'm, I'm not condemning. I'm still working on getting some paint work done on my spiritual walk with God. I'm still trying to get some windows clean so I can have clarity. Amen. That's why we come to the house of God. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have not accomplished it all yet. Amen. We're striving for the perfection of God. In that popular Sunday school song, he's still working on me. I'm glad that he hasn't chosen to quit working on me. Amen. I'm a lot better off than I was. But my, I've got to tell you, when I look in the mirror, I see some... Yeah, you know, just when you know when I go on that wonderful date with that woman, they're far and few apart. She won't take me out as often, 
But what, you know, we go in that mirror and we want to make sure that one hair I have is in the right place and uh, everything's looking good. When I look in that mirror spiritually, I know that there are some areas that I, I've got to improve in. I have no room to miss the house of God. I have no room in my, in my endeavor to, to accomplish what God is trying to do in me. Amen. To miss one opportunity for Him to work on me. Amen. I need the whole, I don't know if you feel that way, but I, I oh man, I want to go to heaven. I want to make heaven my home. <laughs> folks, this is not the time to quit. I see folks doing stuff I can't believe. I, I, me and my wife was discussing, I just, how can believers in the last ending of the game in the finality of the stage of life, just kind of become so content and relaxed. Oh, God, help me to step up my game. Help me to be better. Help me to be more aggressive. Help me to be more connected to the power of God. Amen. To be what he needs me to be. Well, God bless you. Good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Turn around and high five without touching social distance. Amen, or, or touch, or hug, or greet your brother with a holy kiss, whatever you want to do. Amen. But I told you, I did say social distancing, so I'm, I am correct. And uh, my wife's going to fuss me, but I made her buy one of those expensive uh, thermometers. And, and, and while I was praying, <laughs> and while I was praying... Amen. I just, uh, you can call me foolish, but I just feel like sometimes that we can, we can, we can aid on to fear. And I'm not trying to be uncautious. You know if you got a fever or not, stay home. You know if you're sick or not. And I don't mean, somebody said, oh, I'm sick. I'm leaving, Pastor. <laughs> I don't mean that kind. I'm talking about when you know you're really, really sick, you know. But, but uh, when we come to the house of the Lord, Amen. We're coming to drink from the Lord. We're, trying, we're coming to get some feed, some food from the Lord tonight. And uh, that's what we're here for, to love the Lord. Oh, I'm glad that you come and help me worship Him tonight. Wonderful people of God, we love you. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, the Vic Nairs, amen, need a touch of the Lord and talk to Him uh, today. A lot of complications, and I, and, and I didn't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but I said, Brother Stephen, it's, it's going to take you all a little while. You know, it wasn't just a bump that they, they were in a very severe wreck. And so they asked they ask for prayer tonight that we would hold them up before the Lord. Mom asked that we would pray for her tonight, that she needs really needs a touch of the Lord. We have a situation going on. And uh, it's very complicated to be able to address particular needs when you can't access her or get in. Amen. If you have kin folks in a nursing home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it is frustrating. But uh, we want to hold these needs before the Lord. If you have an unspoken request, would you signify that tonight? The Lord knows. Amen. All across the building. Amen. And if you need prayer in your body, we open these altars up to anoint you with oil. Would you help me take these needs to the Lord tonight? Father, we thank you. You're such a marvelous, wonderful God. We love you, God. We love you. We love you. We worship you. Surely we need your help, God. We need the touch of the Lord in our lives. Oh, I pray, God, that you would help the Vignier family. You know what they're dealing with. God, I pray that you would work in their life. Lord, we don't have answers, but you have answers. We don't have healings, but you're the healer. Lord, and I pray that you would work in every area that is needed tonight. You know the specific needs that are present. And I pray, God, that you will meet those needs. I pray for mom tonight that you would help her, God, that you would help us, Lord, in that particular area. Those that are in the nursing homes, our loved ones, that you will comfort them. God, every hand that was raised, you know the needs that are present tonight among your wonderful people. And I ask that you would help them, that you would strengthen them, and we give you the glory. We give you the glory in Jesus' name for all that you're doing, God. Oh, we need you tonight, God. 
Oh, we need you tonight, Jesus. Just feel like we ought to worship him a little bit. I feel like... Oh, God, give us a spirit of encouragement tonight. Help us in this place, Lord. Encourage our neighbors tonight, God. Encourage our friends, our family tonight. Let them feel the touch of the Holy Ghost. Amen and amen. Praise God. Let the church say hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to give you an opportunity tonight to give unto the Lord. Amen. I, let me just say, I've not had a, or I've not taken the opportunity to thank you for your faithfulness uh, through all that we've been through, going through, and uh, you've been very consistent and very faithful, and we are uh, very grateful for your uh, generosity given unto the Lord. Our ushers are coming to wait upon you tonight. Amen. But uh, we are so thankful for an opportunity to give. Can they not hear me out there? Our ushers. Sir, ma'am? Oh, I, I just wasn't sure. I can't hear out there what y'all hear, so I can only hear what I hear, and I'm, I have select hearing, Brother Travis, so amen. <laughs> amen. Praise God. I better be nice to these guys. We need to pick up a lot of money. <laughs> amen. We might take two of them tonight. <laughs> Amen. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to give unto you. Lord, I pray your blessings upon this church family, those that give. God, I ask that you would bless them in their finances, in their homes, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. And let the church say amen. amen. Give unto the Lord tonight.
you Jesus I exalt you oh God don't invite me to a, a feast or a supper if you don't plan on feed me till I'm full I'm going to eat till I'm satisfied when I come to church, I'm going to get a hold of the presence of the Lord. I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that when the devil shows up, it scares him off. And some of us, we don't think that way. We feel like we have to live under condemnation and that we have to uh, find ourselves just struggling and fighting and just we barely make it. And my God. Amen. Thank God we have the Holy Ghost. I'm not barely making it. Amen. I'm, I'm going to get a hold of the Lord. I'm going to serve. I'm going to worship Him. Amen. But I'm going to let the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, operate in me and through me. Well, praise God. It's Tuesday night. Amen. I fussed you enough on Sunday. I'm going to love all over you tonight. Y'all so pretty. Y'all look so good. Amen. Y'all are so wonderful. Amen. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6. Now, I really need the help of the Lord tonight. I need to get to a certain point in this message, and I don't know how <laughs> amen i started two weeks ago on a tuesday and i made a statement i said that amen if you do not believe that jesus christ is god almighty 
that you cannot have your sins forgiven. Tonight, I need to, at some point, show you in Scripture because I do not want to tarry on a lengthy subject. I told one pastor friend today, I said, when you're talking about the oneness of God, six months wouldn't cover it. Amen. It takes a long time to get into different compartments of the oneness of God. And I just want to maybe just scratch the surface, just scratch the surface. Amen. Aren't you glad that you know who he is? Amen. What's his name? Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5 through 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and here's the part that we enjoy, say we want the Lord to come near to us, but this is really the, the important factor, and in you all. He's not only above, he's not only around, He's not only through, but he desires to be in you all. And so I, I want tonight to continue on my subject, our God is one. It's imperative that you comprehend the many different compartments to this magnificent God that we serve. You cannot sit down in one Bible study and in 30 minutes through the knowledge of man and the expression of Bible study comprehend the fullness of who he is. It takes both revelation and study Revelation and study, those two uh, compartments that are very important. Now, I need God's help so much tonight to get my thoughts. I, I'm, I'm A-D-D-D-D-D, whatever that means. And uh, you put sinus and allergies on top of that with a clogged up head, and then you will understand when you are really trying to to put together with clarity the Word of God to present to these beautiful people amen, that each and every one of us must, must comprehend and understand. I want you to ask the Lord to help me and yourself tonight to receive the Word of the Lord. Would you do that tonight? Father, we come to you tonight. We desire you. We call upon your name. I pray, God, for understanding and knowledge and wisdom, God, tonight. Oh, God, we need you in this place. We need your help. In the magnificent name of Jesus, Lord, open our minds and our spirits tonight. There's none like you, Lord. There is none like you, Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. You may be seated. Someone put a post that was well said. One creator, God. One race, human. One blood, red. One problem, sin. And one solution, Jesus Christ. The truth well spoken and a fact, our world is in trouble. If you don't believe that, you are living in a bubble of hypocrisy. Our world is in trouble. Our world needs the church. 
Our world needs a God that can help aid, deliver, and save them. The experts have attempted to try but cannot fix it. Doctors uh, cannot heal the condition of our world. Bankers cannot fund enough to eliminate the complication of the world that we are experiencing. Psychiatrists can't soothe it and medicine can't cure it. We have all attested to these facts to be true and genuine. The world needs to know who Jesus is. They need more than a thought of who he is. They need more than a family religion. Amen. They need an encounter with the mighty God. I said they need an encounter with the mighty God. He is more than just the man that is upstairs. Amen. He is more than the big man or the big fellow that many of your co-workers and classmates may identify God as, the deity as. The world needs a Savior. They, they need that genuine experience with a relationship with not just knowing about who he is, but knowing an experience and an encounter with who Jesus Christ is, the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. They need the Lord God. They need the mighty God. They need the God who is the great I Am. Ephesians said it this way, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. Can I tell you tonight that our world is dying to know who Jesus is? In their manipulative ways by spiritual influence of a demonic force. They are driving themselves to a reckless death. God is not just interested in being present among us. He is not interested in just going to work on the side of us. I want to make sure you understand that this God that we serve, amen, wants to be in everyone that is willing. It's not his will that any perish, amen, but that all come to repentance, amen. It's not his desire to see anybody die and go to hell. He wants a relationship with every man and woman and boy and girl on planet earth, period. And so the scripture repeatedly declares that God to be absolute one in nature. Uh, this means that he is singular, alone, by himself, and none other God, no other gods with him, within him, or beside him. Amen. The world needs to know this one true God. They don't need to know a counterfeit. Well, I thought somebody would shout a little bit tonight. Maybe we need to go back a little bit. I told you I needed a little bit of help. If you don't help me, I'll preach three times longer. Amen. The world doesn't need a counterfeit. They don't need to know an imagination about a description of a God that they never experienced or never had an encounter with. Amen. There's a lot of fake and hypocrisy in the world that they are a part of. They need to know who this God is. They need to know who the mighty God is. Uh, remember, Isaiah affirms the singularity, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Ye are even my witnesses, there a God beside me, yea, there is no God, I know not any. And so it is the declaration of numerous men of God that made this announcement. The prophet Malachi declared this strict monotheistic truth. Have we not all one? Everybody say one. One father had not one God created us. Look at your neighbor and said there's only one God that made you. 
Amen. There wasn't three gods that made you. There wasn't two gods that made you. There is only one God that made you, and he has a name, and his name is above all names, and his name is Jesus. Monotheism is the belief in one God. A narrower definition of monotheism is the belief in the existence of only one God that created the world. Is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, and intervenes in the world. That is, you can find the definition anywhere as you would like, but it'll all say the same thing. Remember Nehemiah in chapter 9 and verse 6. He said, it's all the Lord's. He made all things. And Nehemiah had a, a tremendous understanding that, amen, he was worshiping this one God that Moses declared for them to worship. I'm glad I'm still worshiping Moses as God. I'm glad I'm still worshiping Abraham's God. I'm still I'm worshiping the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, and I'm still worshiping the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever who changes not. King David recognized this fact in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 22, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. I'm glad today that I have a complete understanding. I am not confused who I'm worshiping. I'm not troubled about if there's one God, three gods, five gods, that I know that there is only one God. John says it this way. And I want you to pay attention in chapter 5 and verse 42. For had ye believed Moses. Now Moses had something to say about it. Jesus is referring to the Jewish attack. Amen. They, they came to Jesus, and, and there was just a little bickering and a complaining. There, 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 there was a little name-calling. There was a lot going on. And Jesus pauses for a moment, and uh, he, he points them to the gentleman that they... they I, I don't know where I went, but I've got extremely loud up here, sis. Thank you so much. Just a little lower. Amen. But uh, they, they knew Moses was acknowledged. They believed in the man Moses. They understood his writings. And so Jesus, under attack, he reverts back. Their, he brings their attention to Moses. Ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Who did Moses write? Was Jesus standing when Moses was writing in the commandments? I appreciate the commandments, but that's not what he was talking about. When uh, Moses was uh, conversing with the children of Israel and it's penned of the covenants, it was not the covenants that Jesus was making reflection to. But if you believe, in verse 47, not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? If you're not going to believe Moses, the man that you have heeded to the writings and upheld the laws of this man and built your doctrines upon him, Jesus brings the Jewish attackers to the writings of what was in the forefront of their beliefs and their ideas that this Moses was the answer. And Jesus said, well, I, I've got something to tell you, friend. Did you not understand? You believe the writings of Moses. You're preaching the writings of Moses. You're telling everybody to live accustomed to the way of Moses. And th this is how we, we abide in our lives and our families. This is how we get our customs and our covenants and our commandments or the laws. And yet Jesus stops him and says, friend, amen, there's no way that you can denounce me if you don't denounce the laws of Moses because Moses began to write uh, hey, hero Israel the Lord our God is one. Uh, he was not writing about a substitution. He was writing about the deity of God. He was writing about the manifestation. You could not separate it. Jesus says you know what? Moses was writing and pinning about me. 
Now, how do you argue by using your own philosophy, using your own skill, and with a profoundly iconic twist, Jesus turns the table on his Jewish accusers. In the final judgment, their great lawgiver and their great statesman, Moses himself, would indict them for failing to believe in the writings. Because you cannot believe in the commandments and not believe in the one that gives the law. You cannot proclaim or preach a particular standard or a custom or a doctrine without having one that is above all. Amen. Does that not feel it sound familiar? By not preaching about one that is through all. And by not preaching about one that is in you all. He was talking about, now Jesus, we've got to shut you up and stone you. But Jesus did not stop. What is it that Moses was declaring and emphasizing to the Jews? Was it all what I had said with the laws? Was it, uh, what, was it the commandments? Was, no, it was the revelation of who the God that stood before them as they were accusing Jesus. Jesus, he begins to take them back to the word of the Lord. I want to tell you the answer is always in the book. I said the answer is always in the book. John chapter 8 and verse 23. And probably a rather lengthy reading through verse 28 tonight. And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. Again, Jesus is encountering his Jewish people. Amen. He is, he is encountering the religious sect that had all knowledge. They understood the laws in its proper context. They, they, were, not, uh, they, they were not foolish in their handling. They were very meticulous. They were very accurate. Uh, they were students of the word. They understood, one writer said, the letters of it. And so, and he said unto them, ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world. Now, this is Jesus. I am. Everybody say, I am. He says, I am not of this world. And I said, therefore, unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. I want you to raise an eye at this one. He is declaring to his audience that they are going to die in their sins. He says that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not, if ye believe not what? That I am he. Ye shall die in your sins. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the mighty God, he is saying you can declare all you want repentance. You can go and try to get life. You can go and try to get light. He said you can try to have the remission of your sins, but I am telling you, you will die in your sins. Why are you going to die in your sins if you repent? Because you had no revelation. You did not understand the concept. You didn't understand the doctrine. You didn't understand the oneness of God. And he is giving the writings in the words of the Lord for you and I to take into our heart, for you and I to take into our our mind for you and I to take into our spirit. Why? Because if you don't understand the oneness of God, amen, you will easily be deceived. You will experience deception. You will walk in the lies of the world. But if you can comprehend the fullness of God, you know where your power comes from. You know where truth comes from. You know where your salvation comes from. You know where your redemption comes from. It comes from the mighty God. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Jesus not only makes a declaration that he is the I am, and that they would die if they did not believe that he was the mighty God. Then they ask him who he is when he finishes, and he, he declares unto you from the beginning. Now, 
if that is not revelation in the Word of God, that He is the beginning and the end, if that is not comprehension that He is the first and the last, then you will not believe that this mighty God is Jesus. I have many things to say unto the judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world of those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake unto them of the Father. Amen. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man. Would you pay attention to that? When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. I want you to hold on. That I do nothing of myself, but as my Father that taught me, I speak these things. At the cross, Jesus declared to the world. At the cross, while he hung in crucifix, he declared that he was the great I am. And so he was making a poke at the Jews. He said, you do not believe me now. Matter of fact, I'm fixing to show you they, they've gotten in a very intense argument. Amen. It, it, it got very, very severe. But he says, you will not believe me now, but there are going to be some things that happen. Amen. That you are going to believe me uh, when, uh, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man. At the cross, he declares... At the death of Christ was shown the effect, a major change in natural order. The sun that was created by the mighty God didn't shine. It lost its light. The holy of holies lost its exclusiveness when the veil was rent in two. The grave lost its dead when that hour took place. When it was, amen, said and done, there was such a profound move of the Spirit of God upon the earth. Now, let me play just a moment with you. Where did the dead that came out the grave and went to Jerusalem go after? Tell me after service. You, you want to talk about a radical shift of events. When there was a comprehension of this great, mighty God. Jesus said, I, I don't come of myself, verse 42 in chapter 8. He said, I, I come from God. I didn't create myself. I just became the flesh. They would not accept Jesus as God. Verse 44, Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. There's a pretty much heated discussion that starts to unfold in chapter 8. There is no truth in him. He was speaking of Lucifer. And that there would be no truth in him. That he was filled with lies. But in verse 48, the Jews told Jesus that Jesus had a devil. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I already know what side I'm on and who I believe. One didn't know the difference between a devil and a God. Ah, I can preach right there for a moment. I said one didn't know the difference between a devil and a God. Amen. And then Jesus, the mighty God, knew that there were demons on the inside of those that were accusing him. Jesus said, you know what, guys, let me just tell you straight. I don't have a devil in me. He could have referred him and may have. I don't know. That would have, wouldn't have been recorded. Uh, you can't serve two masters. But in 51, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Jesus is declaring to his accusers. Uh, then they come back in verse 52. Now we know, we're convinced that you have a devil. And they, they start this little conversing. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. 
declaring them that if they didn't believe in this mighty God, if they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, if they did not believe that Jesus was the Redeemer, if they did not believe that Jesus was God Almighty robed in flesh, he said that they would die in their sins. I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in packing all of my rotty old ways of the past. I'm not interested in all of my failures and my faults and my shortcomings in life. And there are a whole lot. I'm so glad that I had a revelation that when God, amen, got a hold of my heart, he brought me down to an old-fashioned altar, and I began to cast my sins there. Hey, friend, I want to tell you, I had no question that Jesus was the mighty God. I had no question to know that Jesus was my answer. I had no question that Jesus was was my Savior. I want to declare to you tonight, amen, that there is no other God. There is no other God. There's only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. I want us to stand tonight. I'm not, I'm not finished by four, amen, but it's a good stopping point. I challenge you Amen. To get a hold of this God. I challenge you if you see it any other way that you begin to study history. I challenge you to go and find out where the doctrine started veering after the word of God a few hundred years after 325 where they started compromising, where they started readjusting, where they started critiquing the word of God. Amen. Uh, I want to tell you today that I'm not trying to add to the word of God. I'm not trying to take away from the word of God. It's all sufficient. It's got everything you need. If you need cleansing, he's got it. If you need healing, he's got it. If you need understanding, he's got it. If you need the infilling of the Holy Ghost, he's got it. If you need comfort, he's got it. If you need deliverance, he's got it. Everything that you need, can I declare to you tonight? He has all your answers tonight. And this God that has all the answers, I want to share him. This God that has all the answers... I want to tell it. Well, the world is in trouble while our society is crumbling apart. He said there'd be a famine in the last days. Not of bread, not of food, but a famine of the Word of God. Because men would not study to show themselves approved. That men would not rightly divide the word of truth. That men would take out of context passages of Scripture and begin to build a doctrine upon it. Now I understand that if I was to quote to you tonight about, uh, about Jesus being on the right hand of the Father, and we may get there a little later, Amen. That you could be confused if you did not understand and search all the scriptures what right hand actually meant. If you did not know that there was a reference in the scriptures to the right hand as an authority or as power. If you didn't find that when they referred, they weren't talking, God doesn't have a right hand. God doesn't have body parts. I said God doesn't have body parts, but he referred to the eye. He referred to the hinder part. He, re he referred to the right hand. Amen. But when you fail to take and navigate through the words of God and find its, its completeness of it. Amen. It's easy. I'm telling you now, it's easy to get bogged down with a couple of verses that may stun you and may shock you. But when you begin to search the word of God and you begin to pray for understanding and revelation, it's at that moment that you have an enlightenment by the Spirit of God. And there's no better way to have an understanding than have the Spirit of God to enlighten you. I wonder if you can lift up your hands and thank God tonight. I wonder if you can thank the Lord tonight for His Word. Thank the Lord tonight for His power. Oh, God, I, 
I'm so glad that I've had my sins forgiven. I'm glad they're not hanging, God. I'm glad they're not before me. I'm glad that they washed uh, in the revelation of who Jesus is. I'm glad that the blood of God purchased the church. I'm glad that I was redeemed by that blood. Oh, flesh and bone, Jesus, you have. But you don't have no blood because it paid the redemption of the church. It paid the price of every sinner. Oh, God, I love you, Lord. I wish somebody would just praise him right now. Amen. You ought to be able to shout over the great I am. I said you ought to be able to shout over the great I am. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. You are the one who rose I need you. The one who Oh, God. Listen, listen to me in closing tonight. I do not want to come to you tonight. And if you have a different theory, and I certain probably no one does, but if you did, I'm here only tonight because I love you. And I want to declare to you the full benefits of this magnificent, mighty God. I get no pleasure in winning a debate. I receive absolutely no glory in winning a conversation, but losing an individual. My spirit would be poisoned and rotten if I came just to try to make mockery or to probe you or to try to provoke you I want you to know tonight I love you I want you to know that this world has enough obstacles and enough battles in itself and I just want to help you tonight understand that you have some help he's a present help in a time of need I said he's a present help in a time of need And while there's a lot of stress and a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety in our world, I'm telling you the church needs to fall on her knees like never before. Our prayer room should be full, more full now than it was a year or two years ago. Amen. There ought to be more folks calling on the name of the Lord now with continued prayer, with in-home prayer, with, with, with prayer in the car, with prayer on your job, with prayer everywhere you go. Amen. The church needs to pray like she's never prayed before. Amen. Why? Because we can't lose our hope, church. We can't lose our hope. You lose your hope and you're going to lose your battle. I said, if you lose your hope, you're going to lose your battle. Amen. But I I don't only have hope in in this world only. I don't have hope only in my relationship with Jesus Christ in this world. Amen. I've got hope in a world to come. This world is not my home. I'm not. They got, a, they got a lot of nice classic cars out there, and I like them. But I ain't found one classic car that would make me want to stay. I have not found. They got some fine homes. I'm just glad they're the ones that have to clean it and fix it. There's a whole lot of nice boats and four-wheelers and all that. And I'm not against that. If you have that, I'm not against that. But that does not entice me. Oh, I want to drag who I can with me on my journey going to heaven. I want to get my family going to heaven. I want to get my neighbor going to heaven with me. I want to get my city going to heaven with me. I want, to get, I want to get the Republicans and the Democrats. Amen. I don't like their sin, but I love their soul. Amen. I want to get them with me going to heaven. Some of them I'd like to lay hands on suddenly. Amen. In more ways than one. But I'm telling you, when you look at the soul of man and you look at the eternity of man, Friend, it's bigger. I said it's bigger. It's bigger than just coming to church. It's eternity. Shout it. Say it's eternity. Come on, shout it out loud. It's eternity. 
you will spend eternity somewhere. Lord, we thank you tonight. Your help, your strength, your power.